My name is Matt Galloway. I'm the host of uh, Metro Morning on CBC Radio 1. I get up when people are still partying just down the street here, um, as they were this morning. Um, we're delighted to have you here uh, to talk uh, about what will be an amazing thing when you get to see it uh, soon enough, um, but also just talk a little bit about this festival and talk about filmmaking in Canada, etc. Uh, this is a neat little thing that we have going on here at CBC, and it would be great if you told people about it. You can do it through Twitter. The hashtag, as you see, is uh, fall for CBC. So take photos and tweet and do all of that kind of stuff like that. Um, we'll be around afterwards as well to uh, say hello if you would like to pop by and say hi. We have a couple of great guests here. Um, we'll start with Damon, Damon Oliveira, who is the uh, producer of The Book of Negroes. He has been involved in film and working uh, with uh, Clement for a long time, um, has uh, seen his film screened here, but also all over the world as well. Clement Virgo, director of The Book of Negroes and somebody who has made films like Rude, um, has been involved in television, has been involved in helping build this industry in this country for a long time and diversify it as well. Say hello to our esteemed guests, if you would, please. <laughs> Gentlemen, um, do you enjoy the film festival? Is the film festival something that, that you look forward to in this city? We can talk about your work in a moment, but what do you make of the circus that's happening outside us right now? Well, you know, uh, morning, Matt. Um, you know, this is my first event. I was at the gym about 20 minutes ago, and I got a call to say, you're late, you gotta get down here. <laughs> um, so I jumped in the shower, I did shower, got on my bike, and We're I rode down. thankful for that. <laughs> um, but um, it, the, the, the TIFF has always been a great place to be. You know, I've, I've, I've shown short films here, I've shown feature films here. Um, it's a great place to network, a great place to see films. Um, I, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing a bunch of films this year. Um, and, it's, and it's great not to have that pressure of having to show something that you've done, at least not yet. For them, the business perspective, how important is a festival like this? There are a lot of different festivals, but from your perspective in, in the business side of things, how important is that? Um, Thanks for having us, Matt, first of all. Um, uh, I, I love this festival. I've, I've sort of grown up as a filmmaker with TIFF, um, and I think uh, you know, the festival has evolved over the years. I know there's a lot of discussion around that right now, but for me, uh, I think it's one of the best places to do business, certainly as a Canadian filmmaker. Um, for me, it's sort of the, the start of the back to school year, you know, every, every September, that week that school's open, that's the week that TIFF is in. And uh, for me, that's just, you know, like a, a really nice ritual, I find. Um, uh, the business uh, right now that, uh, that is going on here, you're seeing a lot of big films that are coming here to be launched for their Oscar campaigns. But at the same time, there's a selection of a lot of independent films that are coming, you know, from the farest reaches of the world. And this festival is great at giving us a global perspective, which is something that, you know, Toronto is, is talked about a lot in, in, in the context of the United Nations as being this really diverse city. And I think the festival is a great reflection of who we are. Last question just about the festival, which is, is how strong is that industry here? People always wonder whether the Canadian film industry gets um, run over like it's in an avalanche or something like that by all the international films, the American films, the films that, as you say, are up for Oscars. At this time in this city right now, how strong is our film industry? Well, we had three Canadian films play at the Cannes Film Festival this year. Two of them are here at TIFF. So I think that's a pretty good representation, you know, of where our industry is right now. Come on. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think on the French side, obviously, there's been some great filmmakers uh, over the last uh, a few years. Um, uh, on the English side, we have uh, people like Adam Goen, uh, David Cronenberg. Um, we, we have some younger f filmmakers coming up. And we have a lot of great uh, first-time films, so I, th I think we have a very, very healthy industry. Tell me about um, The Book of Negroes and when this started for you. What, what was the first point of contact for you with this book in terms of thinking we could do something with this? Well, well, the truth of the matter is, Matt, that I didn't really even want to read the book because um, I didn't like the title of the book. <laughs> uh, this idea of making a, a story called The Book of Negroes didn't really appeal to me. So for a long time, I kind of avoided it. And um, Molly Johnson, who you may know, Molly uh, saw me uh, in a bookstore um, and said, look, Clement, you have to buy this book. I'm like, I don't want to buy this book. I'm not interested. 
She said, you gotta buy this book. She took my wallet out of my pocket, <laughs> took out my credit card, and forced me to buy the book. So I bought it, and even then I sort of like put it on my coffee table, and I left it there for about two months. And then one day I picked it up, and I read it, I started to, to, to read it, and I read it all the way through. And then I, I, I went into the office and I said, Damon, you gotta read this. I think, I think there's a movie in this. And so he read it right away. Um, and that was about four years ago. And at that time, we thought it was gonna be a feature film, but of course, um, it's such a big, sprawling story that it, didn't, it couldn't really fit into a feature film. And then the CBC uh, you know, generously came on board. Um, uh, Sally Cato at the CBC was a, was a big champion of the project, and so she brought us in. Um, and, um, and, we, and it's now a miniseries. Did you automatically see it as something that could be filmed? It is a big, sprawling yeah. book and a wild, complex story. Uh, I, I was overwhelmed. I mean, when, when, when I read the book, I had a visceral, emotional reaction to it, as I think probably a lot of you. How many of you have read the book, by the way? Okay, so you're, there's fans out there. But it was immediate, and I felt this is one of the most visual books that I'd ever read. But it was also probably the largest thing that Clement and I had ever set out to do as a, as a creative challenge to make something. Um, and as Clement said, because we come from feature filmmaking, primarily that's what we were thinking about it as. And at the same time, we also knew that it was so large that it could probably fit into the medium of television. And I think what worked in our favor is that long form narrative television was being you know, high demand you know, with, with services like Netflix. Mm -hmm where people want to watch stuff in a, in a long arc. And I think that really worked in our favor too, as far as serving an audience. Mm -hmm. That's something that we were also really interested to tell a story on a canvas that was six hours, as opposed to say two and a half hours. Adaptation is really difficult. I'm fascinated with the idea and the process of taking something from one medium and putting it into something else. In part because you gain things, but you also lose things along the way. How difficult was it to try and figure out how to adapt this story? Well. First of all, I think the first thing we did was we, we um, asked Alaric to be a part of the process, Lawrence Hill um, a part of, as, as a part of that process. And so we sat in a room for about uh, two weeks and we had a board and we just broke down the story. Um, and, um, so how hard was that? Because there are, I mean, he's the writer. He loves the story. You can't take something out of something that he loves. Uh, well, Actually, uh, <laughs> Larry used to be a journalist. Yeah. And then he became a writer. He, he knows the value of editing. And uh, that was really helpful because sometimes writers can be a bit possessive of their material. Sorry, Clement. You know, and, 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 uh, and Larry wasn't very precious about his, about his work. He was very open and, you know, and, and at first I was very gentle with him. I said, look, there's certain things that work in, in terms of a novel that doesn't work visually because I, I tend to focus more on the visual aspects of um, storytelling. And uh, there's things in the novel that we couldn't really I felt we couldn't really do in the miniseries, one of which, I won't spoil it for anybody, but there's a main character in the story that dies off screen. And they said, look, we can't, if you invest you know, four hours in this character, there's no way we could not have that character, uh, you know, if he's gonna die, he's, he's, you know, he, he has to die on screen, so we all feel it, <laughs> you know? Um, so we, we really tried to be as economical as we could, and to, and to not be precious about the story, just to, to make sure that we were, um, we try to honor what he wrote, but try to translate that into a new medium. And I think to add to that is that, you know, it's a, it's a visual medium that we're working with. Larry is a wonderful writer. Um, you know, he can, he can spin an interior dialogue or monologue that a character is having for pages, but when you're doing it on film, especially for television, Time is always of the essence. Sure. So. Yeah. Um, what about trying to figure out who is going to be uh, delivering this? I mean, how difficult was it for you to find? There are extraordinarily strong characters at the heart of what is a really intense story. How do you go about finding those people? Uh, we looked at over 200 actresses for the role of Aminata. Yeah. Uh, the, the character of Aminata is played by two actresses. Uh, you'll all soon discover Shailen Pierre Dixon, who is 11 years old and just a phenomenal discovery for us, and she's Canadian. 
Um, and then we opened up the call to look beyond Canada, beyond the States. We looked around the world for our Aminata because that was the most crucial character. She must age, the older character ages roughly 35 to 40 years in our story. So we had to find an actress that could really play both ends of the age scale, but who was also, you know, invested and really credible. And I think, uh, you know, when we met Ingenue, we actually saw her audition tape first. We just knew, both of us, immediately that that was the character that what we were looking I mean, for. I mean, you just knew. I mean, what, what did she deliver that kind of knocked you out? Well, I mean, after you look at um, a lot of tapes, and a lot of them are not great. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, I mean, you know. Struggling and then, actors and actresses <laughs> know what you're up against. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and then you see someone that stands out. It, it becomes quite quite apparent that this is a great actress, and we needed someone who could play from from 19, 18, 19 to all the way up to uh, 50s, and so she had that range. She had that full range to be able to play quite young, that sort of exuberance of of youth, but also the the gravitas of someone who's more mature. So once we saw that tape, after seeing a lot of tapes and seeing a lot of people. Uh, she just uh, stood out to us. What was the shoot like? I mean, I spoke with you. You were uh, in South Africa. Yes. Um, yeah. What was what was it like shooting this story? Well, you know, um, in South Africa, it was uh, it was 35 degrees. It was hot, um, and uh, we we left South Africa. We went to Nova Scotia. It was minus 10 degrees. <laughs> so in South Africa, we got sunburn. In Nova Scotia, we got windburn. Um, so it was, um, we shot six days a week, and it was the hardest, probably physically the hardest thing that I think we've ever done. Yeah. Um, what we did get in South Africa was incredible production value. It is one of the most beautiful countries in the world, and it served all of the places. We go to, I think, 13 different locations, yeah. cities in this story, three continents uh, over the course of 50 years. So. We were able to really work with what was available in South Africa in order to tell the story. Part of this is, is telling um, something th that, I mean, it's fiction, but there's so much that's invested in this, and people will see or look for accuracy or authenticity in a story like this. How do you try and capture that and ensure that the story that you're telling isn't just true to the narrative, but in a way true to history? Does that matter to you? Well, you know, it's 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 hard to tell if it's uh, if you're accurate because you know it's I wasn't there. <laughs> of course, yeah. You know, so part of what you rely on is is you know does it feel emotionally truthful? Obviously, you you hire the the right people to make sure that they get the world right. But in, in terms of how to play out the emotions of the story, you know, all we have are our instincts in terms of does it feel and does it sound and is it act and does it feel right? And sometimes you can't always articulate that. It's just a feeling. That just, you know, just makes sense to me. And so um, that's what we go on. And, you know, some, some of the best historic films have actually invented history. Sure. But emotionally they take you on a journey that you can't deny it. And this notion of making something that is truthful, I mean, most documentaries are scripted, right? So uh, I think we talked a lot about that because we have fictional characters in a historic context with characters that really existed, like George Washington, Sam Francis. Um, so it was a balance. And, and as much as we could, I would say, you know, we were doing the Wikipedia checks, you know, for the dates. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we do take some creative license. Yeah, and obviously all the all the dates we want to make sure were 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 accurate, um, and we wanted to make sure the world felt consistent. But in terms of um, reality, in terms of this idea of uh, reality yeah. on film on on screen, it doesn't really make sense to me because um, the, the you know some of my favorite films wouldn't be considered or real. <laughs> It's also, this story is a really difficult story at times to read. I mean, there, there are elements of, of real brutality in it. There is, I mean, just even at the heart of it, um, it, it is a story of, of loss, but it's really gripping and, and awful. When you're making art that, that is based in something that intense, is it difficult to do? I mean, do you feel an emotional connection in, with, with the material as you're trying to produce it and shoot it? Well, you know, I, I, part of what I've 
part of what I was really focused on and what we were really focused on is not, not having the audience watch the miniseries but actually feel it. Feel it. I mean, what I mean by that is that I wasn't, we weren't that interested in showing just a catalog of horrors. It was just brutality for the sake of brutality. We wanted the audience to hopefully uh, identify with Amanata, be with her on her journey, feel for her, um, and, 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 and feel emotionally engaged by it as opposed to just watching the story and being detached and saying, oh, isn't that horrible? So we were really sort of focused on that and making sure that the, there was an emotional connection to her as opposed to just a, you know, uh, look at that history, isn't that horrible? Yeah. You mentioned you're just down, you're at the United Nations. Yes. Tell me a little bit about, I mean, because this picks up on that, the idea of shooting something about a subject like slavery. Um, what was being discussed at the UN? Um, we just got back this morning, actually, from the United Nations. Uh, there was a presentation last night, which was the final one in a year-long film festival on the remembrance of slavery around the world. Um, and they had shown 12 Years a Slave, They'd shown Bell. They'd shown a number of documentaries that had been made coming out of Africa. Um, and uh, it was exceptional because they had gathered a number of filmmakers. Uh, Lou Gossett was there with us, along with uh, filmmakers based in New York. And, um, you know, I had actually worked at the United Nations when I was going to school in New York. So for me, it was this exhilarating moment to come back and to be able to give them a preview of the Book of Negroes. So, they're in the process of inviting us back next year to uh, present an episode or two. Uh, and uh, what we had was like a full-on discussion around the notion of how slavery is represented and how we continue to do that as filmmakers. You mentioned a quotation by uh, Steve McQueen. Yeah, um, Steve McQueen said, uh, slavery is the hole in the canvas of cinema. And uh, I think that was, that was a good starting point for the discussion yesterday. When you, we started talking about this, you said that you didn't want to read the book because of the title. Mm -hmm. Have you come to terms with that, that title? Now I couldn't, I, I can't imagine it being called anything else. Because it was called, what was it called in the States? It was called Someone Knows My Name. Someone Knows My Name. Yeah. Um, now I can't, yeah. For me, it's, that's what the story is. And, and the, the Book of Negroes is actually a ledger that um, lists all the names of the black loyalists that helped the British during the American Revolutionary War. So for me, it's a very apt title, and I could not imagine it being called anything else but the Book of Negroes. Do you think that that word will still rattle people? It's the kind of word, I mean, for obvious reasons, and as we saw with the publication of the book elsewhere, that people really aren't comfortable with. Is it the kind of thing that'll still rattle people, do you think? You know, it, 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 it did rattle me, and I, and I had to really kind of examine why it did. You know, I think there's a sense of, um, does it, is it, does it denigrate um, bl blacks? And, and so I, had to, I, I struggled with my own feelings about the word. Um, but through the course of making this miniseries, I have I've grown to really uh, embrace that word. You know, having someone call a Negro means someone that has been is strong and, and who's, even though a lot of things have happened to them throughout history, they still, they, you know, black people still sort of stood up. They didn't, they never sort of laid down. Yeah. And so the, the word Negro becomes, for me now, a word that means strength. How does this series uh, fit in with, with the rest of, of what you've done and the work that you've done, do you think? Um, There's a continuum, I think. And I mean, I think it fits, yeah. it's, it's perfect that you guys are doing it for a number of reasons, but yeah. how do you think it fits in? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Clement and I had our first short film here in uh, 1993, and it won the best Canadian short film. And then two years later, we came back with Rude. Uh, Rude was a story set in Regent Park. It was the first uh, black written, directed, and produced film in Canada. It went to Cannes. Um, our most recent film was Poor Boy's Game, which looked at racial struggles in Nova Scotia. I mean, there, there definitely is a continuum. And I think when you look at the continuum of films and media that have been done around slavery, uh, you know, we really felt that with this one, we wanted to be aware of all the work that has come before. Um, I think that 12 Years a Slave is an amazing film, but I think what our series does is it extends the journey beyond the plantation the trope of the plantation, and it takes us into 
How do you find emancipation? How do you overcome uh, this horrendous scourge and bring yourself back to your homeland? I, I think that's a journey that we haven't yet seen on film. I'm very excited to show that. Clement? Well, you know, I, um, I sort of um, see myself as, as trying to contribute something to Canadian culture and Canadian, specifically African-Canadian culture. Um, you know, I, I look for stories that resonate with me, um, and it has to, in, in, in the Book of Negroes, Lawrence Hill gave us a gift. And when he wrote this book, I, you know, he, he really gave us a gift, and I thought, um, we have to try to make this happen. We have to try to m show other Canadians, you know, a part of their history that perhaps they don't know, that I didn't know. And, and so I, I, I felt a certain um, privilege to be able to sort of bring that to, to um, television. That just, it sets up the last question that I had, which is what is the gift that this story has given to Canada? This is an incredibly successful book. You see people everywhere reading it still. I mean, when the book came out, you'd yeah. see people on the subway, you'd see people in Vancouver, you'd see people in Halifax reading this book. People turned on to perhaps a part of Canadian history that they didn't know about or a story that they thought they would never connect with and suddenly found themselves consumed by. What is it that this has given to Canada and what is it that the miniseries will, will do to enhance that? Well, I think, I think the first in point for me, and, and perhaps it's a lot of, a lot of people, is that character of Amanata Diallo. She's such a compelling and interesting character. And, and what Larry does in, in, in the book, he kind of wraps up, he kind of wraps the idea of slavery um, being oppressed in a very interesting historical way where she's being moved through history. And as a reader and as a viewer, you're, you're learning information about history that, that you didn't know. Um, and once she gets to Nova Scotia, uh, that's such a rich and interesting history that um, I think a lot of Canadians find it fascinating that we didn't learn, you know, learn that in school. And, 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 and Larry sort of gave us that information, gave us that gift. And now, in part because of the book, we are learning it in school. I mean, the book is yes, right. moved into the curriculum and people are reading it in classrooms. Damon? Yeah, um, I'm just going to pick up on the educational strand because we're developing a really vital educational guide that will go along with the series. Um, we've already, you know, been engaged in discussions with some schools, it's on the curriculum, it's starting to push out across the country, beyond Ontario and Nova Scotia, who've really embraced the book. So that, for me, is one of the most exciting things, because I think in my entire high school history career, I might have had a week of black Canadian history. So I'm, I'm just excited to bring the next generation along. When are people going to be able to see this? Uh, That's the key question that I should have asked <laughs> at the very beginning. It is a key question. It is under discussion, and um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say, but I think it'll be <laughs> early 2015. Soon. Yeah. Are you happy with it? Yeah, I'm... I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, you about, work uh, on something like this oh, for yeah. a long time, and I mean... It, yeah. You, you well, know. yeah, I'm, I'm very happy. And, you know, uh, uh, for us, it's... Uh, we want people to see it. We want as many, many Canadians to see this as possible. So, um, you know, part of what we want to do is make sure that the word get out, you know. So doing things like this, for me, is, is really crucial because um, I want people in this country to, to know about their history. Not that it, and, and, and hopefully no one feels that, like it's medicine, that it's, you know, something that's good for them. And hopefully what we've done is create a, a compelling enough story that will draw people in and keep them coming back week after week. Um, and, and hopefully we'll have uh, big ratings like you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to see it. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. These smart men will be uh, available for you to uh, harass and get your photo with and talk to them about uh, all the details that they'll release, if you can, uh, about this miniseries just over there in a few minutes. This thing, this amazing little pop-up, is going to be here all weekend long as well. So when you're down here on uh, King Street West, which is closed off for the weekend, and you're taking over the street um, and not taking the streetcar or driving, come by here. Uh, you can tweet. Again, the hashtag is... Fall for CBC. We're at CBC, and um, hopefully we'll see you here over the next couple of days. Thank you so much.